Uh, this is Art Kaplan, and very pleased to have the chance today to speak with Zeke Emanuel, who's a physician, uh, someone who worked in the White House on health reform, and is currently back at a job that uh, he's been uh, involved with for some time at the NIH, directing the uh, clinical bioethics program at the National Institutes of Health, and thanks, Zeke, for coming. Thank you very much. Well, let me ask you... Uh, a couple of specific questions about your own sure. personal views. I think a lot of these, a lot of people these days are worrying about uh, conflict of interest. I, I hear about that issue on the research ethics side constantly. Uh, I'm just interested in your views on where you think we are on managing conflict of interest in university academia relationships. Well, first of all, I uh, think it's a serious issue. Uh, I think probably medicine, ironically, has both got problems, but has also gone further in thinking about it than yeah. probably any other school in a sort of academic setting. Uh, I think it's pretty clear to me that we've shot in the wrong direction in terms of how to regulate it. You know, we keep talking about disclosure. There's lots of evidence that disclosure is not a very good protection, uh, that it leads to sort of bad incentive structures. Um, and I think we've limited... Uh, we, we need to sort of have more management and more prohibitions. On the flip side, one of the things that's quite clear to me from the policy world is, look, we're not going to ignore these people uh, in the private sector. We have to work with them mm -hmm. uh, willy-nilly. And I think to some degree we've created a situation where close collaborations with the private sector, with the for-profit sector, is seen as a bad thing. And I think that's a mistake. Just take a, you know, something very important, like implementing health care reform. Mm -hmm. you know, you're going to have to work with the insurance companies. There are for-profit mm -hmm. hospitals. There are uh, drug device uh, manufacturers. There are all sorts of uh, other you know, profit-making entities that have to be worked with. And to say that you know, I'm holier than thou, I'm not going to work with you, I'm not going to take your money to sponsor conferences and things, I think is a mistake because we have to bring these perspectives together. Now, you know, whether that's buying opinions or not, I think we've gotten to a situation where any relationship has mm -hmm. been tainted. The charge of conflict of interest, I think, is way too fastly put out. Just, you know, you and I will recall probably four or five years ago, there's a big article in JAMA about, you know, if you offer advice to a hedge fund, mm. you're in a conflict of interest. Well, that's complete, in my view, that article is just wrong. I didn't understand what a conflict of interest is. And so we've gotten to the situation where, you know, any relationship with anyone who's making money is a conflict of interest. That's false. And so I think we need to be a little more subtle about it and a little more realistic also about the fact that um, uh, we need to intersect with those people. And it can't simply be that every time you have a financial relationship, you can't be objective. I think it would be a lot more interesting for us if we thought of different kinds of relationships uh, where you know, scholarly work could be done to influence policy uh, without uh, necessarily the taint. And I think we haven't, just haven't done that. Let me ask you about another area that's been very uh, controversial, and that is end-of-life care. Um, you know, in some ways, I think in bioethics, we felt for uh, some time that there had been a kind of settled uh, agreement and consensus on key aspects of how to manage end-of-life care, and that Terry Schiavo case tossed that somewhat into doubt, I think, for some. And there also has been a lot of pushing and shoving around the idea that discussions of end-of-life care inevitably lead to discussions of money and cost containment and so forth. Where do you see us now in terms of uh, end-of-life care, in terms of, you know, is it a political football? Can we really ever get on top of managing uh, humane dying in America? It is a political football because you can scare people about it. Um, that's very unfortunate. There at various points, there did seem to be a consensus about it, and I think you're uh, right, although I might disagree with you. I think the, the result of the Terry Schiavo case is that those people who were sort of saying, you know, we really need to uh, have only one position, and that's to save anyone's life, no mm. matter what the family said, I think they got beaten back. And yep. I think in, in some large measure that blew up in, in, in their face. I think most Americans said, look, isn't this a, a family decision? I, what I, we I, really want... I only meant in one sense it, it got shaken political. to the core yeah, political. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But I do think it, it, in some ways my reading of that uh, is that it reaffirmed mm -hmm. the fact that this is what the public wants is a set of legal structures that allows a family to make a decision with the health care providers outside the glare of sort of a legislature making a decision, which seems crazy. 
uh, the second point I would make. We've had a major change in social policy in this country. Uh, when I, uh, in the early 1980s, when I began medical school, over 70% of cancer patients died in the hospital. Mm -hmm. Today, it's probably under 30%, maybe even under 25%. That's a huge change mm -hmm. now. Uh, and that means that people are doing, you know, uh, uh, involving hospice and all sorts of other things uh, ta and talking about patients. Similarly, most cancer centers when I started being an oncologist didn't have a palliative care service, barely even acknowledged that, can that patients died on our service. Now, every major cancer center has a palliative care service and gets them involved early. I notice the oncologists are encouraging conversation yeah, now early. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. So I think the real issue is when the culture of medicine is going to really change and you know whether you have to pay for this, whether it's a combination of better communication mm -hmm. training, uh, better teamwork, having smoother transitions out of the hospital. I think all of that is going to uh, be important and I think that's where we really need to, to shift. Um, uh, I think this debate about whether Medicare provides a reimbursement, it's a very political football, but it's in some ways, in my view, a sort of sideshow. Well, I think, you know, there, there are many other issues we could pursue, but in the interest of uh, time, let me wrap up with this question, probably the toughest one I've asked you. It, it looks, you know, that we have a hard time in America. You brought up yourself uh, the issues of allocation around uh, scarce flu supply, organ uh, distribution has been a long-standing interest of mine, but it does seem that we have a darn hard time in this country grappling with questions of allocation and rationing under public policy. And I'm just curious about your own thinking about that. Can we actually get a dialogue going in the society? What would it take? How can we make uh, what seems to me, if you look forward demographically, institutionally, an inevitable discussion we're going to have to continue to have how do we get it done? Okay, so first of all, let me partially disagree with you. Uh, when I was talking about flu vaccine and, and uh, organs for transplantation, those are areas where uh, there's absolute scarcity. No matter what you do, you're not going to get enough liver. Pure to rationing. You have yeah. to ration. There's no alternative. There are a few areas in medicine that are like that. The vast majority of things aren't like that, um, where we don't have enough livers or whatever. We have enough hospital beds, we have enough specialists, etc. There it's a very different problem. If you look at how we spend our money, 10% of the people with chronic illness consume two-thirds of the dollars. So if you're interested in reallocation, you're interested in better quality of care, whatever it is, you've got to concentrate on that 10% with chronic illness. And there it seems to me the real cost savings and healthcare improvement is can you keep these people healthy and therefore out of the hospital uh, not using medical services, not needing amputations or heart procedures or whatever. And that requires a, a set of financial incentives, which we don't have under the current system. And so I think the real challenge, you know, whether this is, uh, is can we incentivize people mm -hmm. to uh, keep, can we incentivize the healthcare system to keep people with chronic illness healthier, longer, so that they require, uh, they live a higher quality life, they have better medical care, and they have, use fewer resources. Um, that's the Measure. So you want to I, square up that? No, curve? I don't think so. I don't think it's a square up, but you want a slower plateau, as okay. it were. And <laughs> I do think that there are some healthcare systems that have been able to do that. Um, if you look around the country, there are some places where the quality is above average, where they're keeping people out of the mm. hospital, mm. and yet they're getting high quality outpatient care, and they're saving fifteen percent. So uh, typically, the trade-off is a lot more outpatient visits, a better management of, of pharmaceuticals. Uh, and a decline in hospitalizations. But that requires a different set of financial incentives. So I don't think it's a matter of rationing. Mm -hmm. I think it's a matter of rethinking how we're delivering care to those people who use a lot of care. And I think that's where we need to be headed. Well, let me thank Zeke Emanuel for uh, giving us the time for this interview today. And it's much appreciated. Thank Great. you. It's my pleasure to be here.